All right, family, come on, let's stand one more time for the reading of God's Word today. If you're glad to be in church, somebody say yes. Yes. Come on, high five your neighbor and say, welcome to church, welcome to church. Welcome to church. Come on, look at somebody and say, have you lost weight? Don't let them tell you, just... I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. If you're new to the Bible, that's the last book of the Bible. And so I never want to take it for granted that people know or don't know how to navigate the Bible. The Bible is made up of 66 books, and so Revelation is the last book in the Bible. We're going to go to the very first chapter in that book. And as you're getting situated there with your Bibles and your notes, make some noise if you're thankful for the Word of God today. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> So as you're you're getting yourself ready there, I want to give a shout out to our online campus. We love you so much and so thankful that you're able to worship with us online, whether you're near or far. Thank you for being part of the Avenue family. And just want to give a a hello and a shout out to a couple individuals that we know are watching with us and worshiping with us, along with many others. want to say hello to Janice. We've got Becca and Ashley. We've got State College, Pennsylvania in the house today. And we've got Big Stone Gap, Virginia, along with so many more. Come on, help me welcome our online campus today. Oh, come on, we can do better than that. Make some noise for them. We love y'all. So we're in our series. Actually, hold on a second. But before you leave today, make sure you grab some invites. Some invites to the Hope. Um, This is a free, obviously, experience. It's going to be five services. 7 p.m. on Friday, 11 a.m. and 11, 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. on Saturday, 11 a.m. 7 p.m. on Sunday. It's obviously free, but the seats are limited each time, and so we want to make sure that we can host you and your guests that are coming. It is a creative way to present the greatest story ever co- told with Jesus, and so you don't want to miss it. It's something we've never done before. It's going to be awesome, and so it's called the Hope. Make sure you grab a ton of these and invite some people to come with you to the Hope this Christmas. All right. It's going to be so good. Somebody say Merry Christmas. That, that's for all of you. I got to have my Thanksgiving first, people. All right? So. so we're in our series that we've called Blueprints. Are anybody enjoying this? Anybody still love me even after last week? You came back, so. All right. So we're looking into the seven churches in Revelation that Jesus addresses, and these churches are models or plans or blueprints, if you will, for us to, as believers today, to live by. Somebody say today. So five of them, I've told you this every time, and for those of you who are new, this is like brand new for you, five of them get rebuked along with some encouragement, and only two of these churches receive no rebuke. So let's, let's recap real quick. Revelation chapter 1, 9 through 11, Scripture reads, I, John, your brother... And companion in in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. They they killed the 11 others and they exiled John to an island after Jesus resurrected from the dead. Okay, verse 10. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll. This is Jesus now talking to John. Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. And even though there's seven different churches labeled here, this is, these are letters to us. We good? To Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And so today we're going to look at the next two churches, which is Thyatira and Sardis. Um, if you're taking notes, write this down. The title of the message today is Sleeping with the Devil. Sleeping with the the devil. Come on, touch your neighbor and say, get ready, get ready, get ready. Let's pray together. Let's also pray for another local church. God, we thank you for the day. God, thank you for allowing us to have a place to come and worship. And Lord, we want you to know that we recognize that we are not here for ourselves, but Lord, we're here to worship you and to open your word. And where we are falling short or where we're out of line, we're here to get back in line with your word today. Lord, I thank you for the capital C church around the world who is gathering to worship you. And Lord, today we take a moment and lift up a special church, Lord, that is celebrating today. God, we rejoice today with Bethel Missionary Baptist Church, who's celebrating 221 years of ministry. And so, God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for their service. God, we rejoice today that they are the first African-American church in this region. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would bless them today. 
strengthen them. God, will you let them know how much you love them, how much the rest of us churches around them love them. And so, Lord, I pray you bless them today with an amazing day, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of the church. And we commit this time to you. Help us all to open our hearts to your word in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody say an amen. amen. And somebody give God praise for mission, uh, Bethel Missionary Baptist Church today. Amen. All right, you can be seated. Okay, remember how I told you, I told you this last week, all right, I want to tell you this again. I told you that there's two churches that did not receive any rebukes, okay? Like last week, that's not today, all right? Both of the churches we're looking at today get pretty strong rebukes, and it would, it would benefit us to examine this so that we don't. So let's jump right in. Revelation chapter 2. So we were in Revelation 1. We're skipping over to chapter 2. And it, here's what scripture reads starting in verse 18. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance. And I know that you are now doing more than you did at first. Sounds pretty good, right? Nevertheless. I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel. Who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants. He's talking about believers. Into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I cast her on a bed of suffering. And I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. Who's this letter to? The church. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned to Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except, hold, except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule with them, rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery just as, as I have received authority from my father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, here's what we need to learn from the church of Thyatira right off the bat. I'm going to give you two number ones today. Is that good? Two number ones. Number one, God is looking for a church who will fulfill their calling without their faith becoming corrupt. God is looking for a church who will fulfill their calling without their faith becoming corrupt. Can I preach it like I feel it today? Thyatira was a very hardworking city. Actually, it's a business trading center. And it was a very non-Christian city. The church of Thyatira receives the longest letter of the seven churches in which the Lord says, Hey, you've had this working for you. Verse 19, I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, and perseverance, and that you're actually doing more now than you did at first. Your action as a church is good. Your love as a church is good. You've even grown in service as a ministry, and you're doing more now than you ever have before. Come on, this is a laboring, working, serving church. In fact, they grew in their work for God. This is not a lazy church. This is a hardworking church who knows how to serve. So can we learn from them in this area, Avenue? Come on, the Avenue will never be a lazy church. We will never be a faith without works church. Because James chapter 2, 14 through 17 says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but have no deeds? Can such faith even save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, and if one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, here it is, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. So at the avenue, come on, we reach people. 
We are spiritual contributors, not spiritual consumers. Come on, church. It's in our DNA. It's in our mission. At the avenue, we exist to show the world who Jesus is. Newsflash, we show them by our works. We show them by our deeds. We show them by our actions. We show them by serving. We show them by helping in times of need. That's why we give away 325 Thanksgiving meals. It's why we're going to bless over 600 kids for Christmas. It's why we give out food and clothes almost every day. It's why we show up in times of disaster. Come on, Avenue. If we say we love God and that our faith is in Christ, may we always show the world the power of Christ through our serve. It's why we believe that every Christian should serve and be serving in the local church because together we can do more to reach people and together we can make a bigger impact to advance the kingdom of God. Matthew 20 verse 28, Jesus said the son of man did not come to be served but to serve. In other words, if we're ever going to be Christ-like, then we need to learn to give and serve like Christ. Come on, touch two people and tell them we will show them by serving them. We will show them by serving them. Are we good? Come on online, talk to me. We will show them by serving them. God is looking for a church who will fulfill their calling. Come on, we've been called to serve. We've been called to help. We've been called to work. We've been called to action. Amen? Verse 20. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel. We need to fulfill our calling. But we must never allow our faith to become corrupt. Can we handle this today? Thyatira has grown in their love and their impact. But they have neglected the law and their integrity. So here comes their rebuke. Verse 20 through 22, Jezebel, by her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. What are you talking about? Hold on. I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. The word misleads here in the Greek is the word planau. It means to seduce. Thyatira worked hard. They served well. But they tolerated immorality. They lacked discernment. And they compromised in their faith by allowing Jezebel to seduce them into immorality. And as a result of this, many have called this church, Thyatira, the corrupt church. Corrupt. It means to change from good to bad in morals, manners, and actions. Can we peel this thing back today? Christ brings up the seduction of Jezebel in the church, and we must understand what this means. In the Bible, Jezebel forced Baal worship and seduced God's people away from his word to worship false gods and practice immorality. Baal Baal worship included sexual immorality, prostitution, and child sacrificing. And Jezebel seduced him with false worship and manipulative control. Thyatira had everything going for them except holiness. Check it. You can work, serve, help. And you can work, serve, and help some more. But Avenue, your works for the Lord will never cover up the sin in your life. Your works... For the Lord will never cover up the sin in your life. Pastor, why are you talking about sin in the church so much lately? Because sin is defined as anything we do that is in contradiction to God's word. And we've made sin a light thing. Like it's no big deal. And the church has believed the lie that says God will look past it because of our works, because of our serve. Sin is a problem in the church today. 
I'm watching churches implode because of sin. I'm watching pastors fail because of sin. I'm watching leaders walk away because of sin. I'm watching marriages fail because of sin. I'm watching families fall apart because of sin. And it hurts us because sin separates us from God. Sin has the power to destroy families, destroy churches, and even entire communities. It undermines integrity. And it undermines trust. And I'm declaring God's word about sin because our society and our culture and even some churches have accepted a lie from the pit of hell that will tell you there's no problem. Hell has seduced the church into the bed of immorality. It's tried to redefine a healthy sex life. It's tried to redefine God's family. It's tried to redefine God's identity. It's tried to redefine a godly person. Come on, touch your neighbor and say, the devil is a lie. The devil is alive. Jezebel represents the spiritual mother of all of those in the church who live a sinful lifestyle while claiming freedom in Christ. These people in the church feel that because of God's grace, then they are not bound or held accountable to any fixed rules or to God's word. They engage in sin without the fear of punishment from God. And this letter to the church tells us that Christ will judge and destroy anyone who promotes such deception and destruction in his churches. Newsflash, the demonic spirit of Jezebel is trying to infiltrate the heart of the church. In other words, hell is trying to convince us to believe that we can work hard to compensate for our sin, while at the same time allow a demonic presence to influence our lives and our beliefs. That you can serve in the church, that as long, uh, that as, long as you serve in the church, that as long as you do something good, to help people that as long as you can be a Christian oh come on that that, that you can be a Christian and get in the bed with the devil that you can be a Christian and entertain sin in your life that you can be a Christian and still participate in sexual immorality That you can be a Christian and cheat on your spouse like it's no big deal. That you can be a Christian and be addicted to pornography at the same time. That you can be a Christian and be a drunk on the sa- at the same time. That you can be a Christian and be a lying, gossiping, backstabbing, hypocritical liar at the same time. That you can be a, the lie that says you can be a Christian and entertain a life of sin at the same time. The devil will try to tell you that you can be a Christian and get in bail with him the entire time. Hell will try to lie to you and tell you that you can get in the devil's bed and still be close to a holy God. But I've come to dismantle the seduction of Jezebel against the church today. And even if nobody else will, the avenue will be a church that stands for truth and righteousness. We will not corrupt our faith. We will not get in the bed with the devil. We will restore honor for the things of God and for the house of God and for the presence of God. Oh, I wish I could find about a hundred people who will help me restore honor for the holy things of God and stay out of Jezebel's bed. In fact, I need you to get up right now, high five four people, and tell them we will not get in bed with the devil. We will not get in bed with the devil. Come on online, talk to me. We will not get in bed. Come on, look down your whole row and tell them we're not sleeping with the enemy. We're not sleeping with the enemy. We're not sleeping. We're not sleeping with the enemy. Can I remind you for the 17th time, this is not a letter from Jesus written to a lost world. This is a letter written to the church. I need you to look down your whole row again and say, this is a letter for you, baby. This is a letter. This is a letter for you. I'm already looking at the clock. I got 21 minutes. I got, I got to give you these scriptures. 
I'm going to give you three scriptures that say basically the same thing. Can I, can I do it? Re, re, don't, don't read out loud with me. Follow along. 1 Corinthians, New Testament, chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. It says, don't you realize, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Don't get in bed with the devil. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, or thieves, or, nor covetous, or, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 21. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual morality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division. Hey, 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 you know what this is saying? Those who cause division in the church. Envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before in Corinthians, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's hard, Pastor. No, that's the word. Ephesians chapter 5, since you're not convinced. Ephesians chapter 5, 3 through 7. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Buckle up right here. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse joking. So anybody out there who thinks all these perverted jokes are hilarious, well, laugh your way all the way to hell. These are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. For the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Verse 7, don't even participate in the things these people do. Watch. Jesus is writing this letter to the church telling them to stay away from Jezebel because Jezebel will try to convince you that God didn't really mean for you to follow all of those scriptures. And that he'll give you a pass to get away with the sin in our lives. Come on, church. We must not allow the spirit of Jezebel to seduce us, to get us in bed with her. We must never have an affair with Jezebel, or we must stop it if we've started one. What are you talking about, Pastor Jay? Jezebel represents sin. She represents corruption. And she's trying to seduce the church so we miss our calling and we lose our place in heaven. Oh, I've come to sound the alarm today. The church has left the altar with Jesus and has started having an affair with Jezebel. And it's because I love you so much that I'm giving you the truth of God's word today. I don't hate anybody. I love everyone. I hate the sin, but I ridiculously love the sinner. And if you're here today struggling with any type of sin, there is good news. There's hope for you. There's grace for you. There's freedom for you. But I wonder today, where are the real men and women of God? Where are the real pastors and leaders? Where are the real Christians? Where are the real followers of Jesus who will grow a backbone and stand up for what's right? Where are the ones who will get out of Jezebel's bed? Where are the ones who will stay out of Jezebel's bed? The problem with the church today is we're afraid of offending somebody. Oh, I come to tell you that Jesus said in John chapter 8, 32, it's the truth that sets you free. I'm calling for pastors to repent. I'm calling for worship pastors to repent. I'm calling for church leaders to repent. I'm calling for Christians to repent. Repent for the compromise. Repent for the corruption. Let's stop having an affair with Jezebel and let's rebuild the altars in our lives so we can stay close to Jesus and not miss out on heaven. Come on, somebody shout a big amen. Amen. High five two people and say, we must stay close to Jesus. We must stay close to Jesus. Come on, online, talk to me. We must stay close to Jesus. We all right? Verse 22. I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely. 
Please, please hear this, church. I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. He will give you what you deserve. You have a pastor. I'm saved because I gave my heart to Jesus many years ago. So I'm good. I'm going to heaven no matter what I do. I hope this series jacks up every distorted theology you've ever had. I hope this series jacks up every denominational curse you've ever been under. Understand this. To commit adultery with someone means that you're supposed to be committed and faithful to someone else. And Jesus says to the church, if you do not get out of bed with sin, if you don't repent for what you've done, you will suffer the consequences right alongside Jezebel. God is calling anyone who has tolerated the spirit of Jezebel, sin, in their lives to repent. Jezebel was unwilling to repent. And if you're unwilling to repent, you're inviting the spirit of Jezebel into your life. Verse 26, to the ones who remain pure to Christ and his word, he promises them to rule with him over the nations. So how can we overcome this? Stop having an affair with Jezebel. Repent and remember the promise that is waiting for you for all eternity. Come on, Avenue. There is nothing and no one worth you missing the promise that is available for those who will be faithful to God. There is nothing and no one worth you missing heaven and ending up in hell. There is no sin worth you going to hell over. There is no amount of pride worth it. There's no addiction worth it. There's no lie worth it. There's no bitterness or unforgiveness worth it. There's no weekend fling worth it. There's no man or woman boy or girl worth it there's no hit worth it there's no high worth it because baby when I walk through those pearly gates and when I step into heaven for all eternity I'll be higher than I've ever been before and that will forever be worth being true and staying true to Christ and his word oh I wish I had a church who would stand with me and stay true to Christ and true to his word oh that's a good place for an avenue praise break because you're thankful you're on your way to heaven. Woo! High five your whole area until don't miss it for nothing. Don't miss it. Don't miss it for nothing. Don't miss it for nothing. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. God is looking for a church who will fulfill their calling without their faith becoming corrupt. We all right? Can we go on to the second, the next church? This is the fifth church. We got two more next week. Here's the fifth one. Let's move on to the church of Sardis. I told myself to, this week, I need to like include a joke or something. It's like a hard word. But I ain't come to play no games with anybody today. I, I buttered you up. I told you I buttered you up last week. I'm just, I'm just going to give you the word. Church of Sardis, Revelation 3, 1 through 6 says, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I'll explain that in a second. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive. But you're dead. You have a reputation of being alive. But you're dead. Verse 2. Wake up! Strengthen what remains is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. Y'all hear a theme? Repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. And the one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Here's a second number one. Write this down. Second number one. God is looking for a church who will stop sleeping on the job and stay awake with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
God is looking for a church who will stop sleeping on the job and stay awake with the power of the Holy Spirit. Many believe that Sardis was the first city that was converted to Christianity. But it was also believed that it's the first city to turn away from following Jesus. Sardis was the capital of the ancient kingdom of Lydia. It was the city of great wealth and fame. And as a result, catch this, the city and the church of Sardis looked great. Outwardly, it appeared active and alive and had a reputation of success and being very spiritual. But it was relying and coasting off of past experiences. Pastor John Walford writes this, the letter to Sardis is a searching message to churches today that are full of activity and housed in beautiful buildings, but are so often lacking in evidences of eternal life. Christ's word today is to remember, repent, and obey. Remember, repent, and obey. Just as it was to the church of Sardis. Jesus said in verse 1, these are the words of him who hold the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. He's letting them know, hey church, it's not the wealth and it's not the fame that makes a church alive. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, put it up there. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that gives life to the church. The church will be ineffective without the Holy Spirit. And the problem with the church of Sardis, it was spiritual deadness. It had a reputation of being a thriving church, but was actually infested with sin and was spiritually dead. It's why many have called the church of Sardis the dead church. Sardis, you're lifeless. You've fooled a lot of people. You've lost the anointing that gave you life, and now you lack the real, pure power of the Holy Spirit. Three weeks ago, Pastor Ronnie Harrison was here, and I was talking to him in the back between services. And he looked at me, and he said, you want to know why I like you? I said, sure. He said, I've been to a lot of places. And I've known a lot of pastors. He said, but I like you because you're actually saved. And it shook me because of all that God has been speaking to me over the past several months. And several years ago, I had a pastor look me in the eye and tell me that he'd rather have the charisma than the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Don't misunderstand my shock and disapproval. Charisma in itself is not bad. But when you're relying on charisma more than or with no anointing, you're only trying to manipulate people. Ah, you want to know why I'm so careful on who I allow to stand behind this great pulpit in this great church? It's because the anointing of God is sacred and it comes at a high price. And I've had the opportunity to meet way too many pastors that make me want to puke. They look real good on the outside. They look anointed, but they're completely powerless. Here's a pandemic that we've overlooked. We've overlooked sin in the pulpit because of spiritual apathy or because of for friendships and because of a fear of confrontation. The church has compromised the pulpit with affairs and pornography, with abuse and scandals and lies. But I've come to let this church know this pulpit will remain sacred. I will give my whole heart to follow Jesus you can take the fame I'd rather have Jesus you can take the popularity I'd rather have Jesus you can take the charisma I'd rather have Jesus and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to be able to host the supernatural presence and power of the Holy Spirit that will forever change people's lives And I don't even need an amen right there to say that. (laughs) 
I gotta, I gotta be careful. I gotta be careful right here. I've had pastors. Oh, help me, Jesus. I'm trying to, I'm trying to behave because of the red light right there. But I've had some pastors who keep seeking me out, asking me to come and preach in my pulpit. I will not compromise this pulpit for nobody's charisma. If you can't live the life and you can't walk the walk and you can't talk the talk, you don't deserve to be standing behind any pulpit. Pastor, you seem angry in this series. I am angry. I am. The Bible says I can be angry and sin not. But I've had it up to here with the spoiled, rotten, pathetic American church who thinks God owes us something. I heard something this week. I'm going to say it. The American church has become so narcissistic because we think God owes us something. That's not going to be the heart of this house. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Can I get this thing out today? Parking team, help me. Have mercy on me, please. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. I think I need to start going through my friends list. <laughs> deleted. 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 Well, you should love everybody. You should love sinners. Oh, I do. But, but you so-called Christian who you've self-righteously called yourself sanctified and you're living a sinful life. Deleted. The word form used here in the scripture in the Greek is the word morphosis. It means appearance and essential features. The word denying used here in the Greek is the word areneomai. It means to disown, to refuse, to pay no attention to. And Jesus is saying, you look godly, but you refuse to live for me. You look godly, but you pay no attention to me. You look godly, but you've lost honor for me. You look godly, but you're relying on your charisma. You look godly, but you've lost the anointing. You look like a church. You even act like a church. You have a good name. You've done great things. You've worked together. You've served together. But you've gotten in the bed with the devil and have fallen asleep. And now you have no power. Newsflash, the church has no power without the supernatural presence of the Holy Spirit. And the reason why the church in America has no power is because we've gotten in bed with the devil and we've been rocked to sleep by the enemy. And I've been placed on an assignment today to make sure the Avenue Church stays awake. And I've been placed on assignment today to sound the alarm on the American church to wake up. Wake up. I didn't come to preach for an applause today. I've come to preach ah, every word through the spirit of darkness that's tried to come against the church. Your days are over. The word of God is coming against you. The blood of Jesus is coming against you. And there is an army. There is a remnant of people oh, that are rising up in these last days who will stand for righteousness and will not get in the bed of Jezebel. Oh, if you want to be that kind of church, somebody give God some praise today. If we want the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in our church, we must say no to sin and we must say yes to righteousness. 
Oh, God is looking for a church who will say no to sin. Say no to the nothing but trouble nights in the club. Say no to the inappropriate conversations online. Say no to the uh, hypocritical backstabbing gossip party. Say no, say no to the I haven't prayed in months slump. Say no to the addiction. Say no to the sex before or outside of a marriage covenant. Say no to the bitterness. Come on, touch somebody and tell them, say no, baby. Say no. If we want the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in our church, we must say no to sin and we must say yes to righteousness. Say yes. Say yes to what's right. Say yes to prayer throughout your day. Say yes to praise and worship in your house and in your car. Say yes to God's word every day. Say yes to integrity, doing the right thing. Oh, and the hard things when nobody else will. Say yes to love. Say yes to purity. Say yes to sacrifice. Say yes to Jesus. Ah, I wish I could find a church who wants to stay awake and be a church full of the power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody shout yes. Yes. Somebody shout yes. yes. Oh, say yes to Jesus. For it's that power that saves the lost. It's that power that sets people free. It's that power that restores what's been broken. It's that power that heals the sick. It's that power that redeems what's been taken. That restores family. That mends the broken heart. It's that power that empowers every Christian and every church to be victorious. Come on, church. The power of the Holy Spirit is the it factor at the Avenue Church. We are nothing but a dead, sleeping church without Him. We want and need the supernatural presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody shout. Somebody shout. Somebody shout yes. Shout yes. If you want to be a church overflowing with the power of the Holy Spirit, that'd be a good place right now for a Spirit-filled avenue praise break because you want the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody give God your best praise today. Woo! Sit down for a second. Sardis was wealthy, famous, and their comfort rocked them to sleep. The comfort of 1103, getting out so you can get in line for the restaurant, rocked them to sleep. The comfort of having a place to park your car and not have to wait in line to get out of the parking lot rock them to sleep what would happen what would happen what would happen if services overflowed so much that it was you couldn't tell if one service was leaving or one service was coming what would happen what would happen 
is people were so hungry for the presence of God that they were laid out in the altar while people were coming in saying, what's going on in this house? Can I, can I finish? Verse 2. Wake up! Touch your neighbor say, wake up. Strengthen what remains is about to die, for I found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, and hold it fast, and, and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I'll come to you. And I'm reminded of a story in Judges by the name, by the man named Samson, who was a Nazarite, raised by a mom and dad, who taught him to live right, to know the Lord, to serve God. Samson had a lady issue. His mom and dad told him, don't you go around the enemy's camp and find your woman in the enemy's camp. It'll ruin you. Samson, dedicated to God, found himself in enemy's territory, sleeping with prostitutes. One in particular by the name of Delilah. He's never shaved his head, for that's where his secret to his strength came from. Nobody could figure out where his strength came from. The Philistines, their enemy, the Israelites' enemy, could not figure out why this man was so strong. And anytime they faced him, he defeated them. So they set her up to seduce him to get in bed with her. So that he would reveal to her the secret to his strength. <laughs> Please see the church in Samson. She seduced him to get in bed. <laughs> Samson, tell me your secret. Why are you, how are you so strong? And Samson makes up this lie and says, if you use fresh bowstrings and tie me up, then I become as weak as every other man. And so she lures him into bed and seduces him into bed and, and does this, that. And as he's falling asleep, she, she gets those seven bowstrings and ties him up. And when he's good to sleep, she says, Samson, wake up. The Philistines are trying to attack you. And he jumps out of bed and, and defeats them and, and, and strikes them down. And, and everything is fine. Until the next time. She seduces him again. Samson, why did you lie to me? Tell me the secret to your strength. She seduces him again to get in bed. And he says, listen, if you use fresh ropes and tie me up, I become as weak as every other man. And so she does just that. She lures him into her bed and rocks him to sleep. And she ties him up with ropes and does the same thing. Samson, the, the, the Philistines are upon you. They've come to capture you. He jumps as before, jumps up as before and defeats them. And, and, and then for the third time. He gets back in bed with Jezebel, Delilah. Samson, why are you messing with me? Tell me the secret to your strength. You thought he would have learned the first time, the second time. But he plays the game and says, listen, if you braid my hair, he's getting closer. See how he's getting closer. Getting close to the fire. If you braid my hair, I become as weak as every other man. So she seduced him to get in bed with her. And she braids his hair as he's falling asleep and does the same thing. Samson, you've fallen asleep. The enemy, the Philistines are upon you. They've come to attack you. He jumps as, as before and defeats him once again. And then the fourth time. How can Samson be so stupid? How can the church be so stupid? For the fourth time, she gets angry. The Bible says she nags him day in, day out. And finally, he gives in. Can I tell somebody the best way to get rid of any kind of immorality in your life? This is scriptural. Flee! 
leave. Stop sitting on the bedside of sin. Wondering why you're not strong enough to overcome it. She seduces him in bed again and he finally tells her the secret. Well, my hair has never been cut. I've made a commitment to the Lord that I wouldn't do such a thing. She rocks him to sleep and as he's asleep, she shaves off his hair. Philistines come in because they paid her off. Samson, they're upon you again. They've come to capture you. He jumps up as before. And the saddest statement in the entire Bible says, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. And when he awoke, he thought, I'll do as before and shake myself free. But he didn't realize the Lord had left him. And in a moment, and in a moment, he started to realize this isn't who I thought it was, but I've been sleeping with death the whole time. Samson realized in a moment he was sleeping with the devil. He was sleeping with death, trying to kill him. And I've come to sound the alarm for somebody today. Wake up! Strengthen what remains. It's time for the Christians in the church to wake up. It's time for some people to get out of their spiritual slump and wake up. It's time for the church in America to get out of its spiritual slumber and wake up and shake itself loose of everything that's trying to take its power, everything that's trying to take our position, everything trying to keep us from our purpose and try to rob us of our promise. Now, now stay with me real quick. Stay with me real quick. Don't leave. Don't, don't, don't nest. Just, just stay with me real quick. If you're already spiritually awake, it's time to get on fire for Jesus more now than ever before. Here's the big idea, Avenue. Wake up and stop sleeping with the devil. In 2024, the world needs a church on fire for Jesus and overflowing with the power of the Holy Spirit. And every time, and every time, every time, you say, God, I'm going to live for you. But then you walk right out of here and do your own thing. You get yourself right back in bed with the devil. And you say, I'd rather have you, baby. I'd rather have you. And this picture right here, this picture right here is a snapshot of the American church. I'd rather rather have pleasure than promise. I'd rather have a quick fix than a sacrifice that will take me all the way to heaven. And this is a picture of the American church. I'm calling the church to an action step today. I know it's 11, 13. I don't know how we're going to do this. Please, God, please, God, don't let anybody come into the 11, 30 service, turn around and go home because they see a parking lot not emptied yet. Please, God. I'm not joking. Please, God. I'm calling calling the church to an action step. I'm I'm drawing a line in the sand. If you don't want to be what I'm about to say, if you don't want to be a part of this, I want you just to stay at your seat and do nothing. But if you want to be a church on fire for Jesus and overflowing with the power of the Holy Spirit, I want you to take an action step and get to this altar real quick. Come on. If that's you. If that's you, you want to be a church on fire for Jesus and full of the power of the Holy Spirit, get to this altar real quick. Come on, push some chairs back. Get some chairs back. Push some chairs back. Come on, prayer team, help me push those chairs back. Come on. Come on. Come on. There's just something.
church, if you're in this altar right now, every head bowed, every eye closed, this is not a salvation call. This is not a salvation call. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today, and you would be honest with me, honest with yourself, and honest with God, and say, Pastor Justin, I've been taking a nap. I've been sleeping on the job. And today I need to wake up. I need to wake up spiritually. Come on, be honest with yourself. If that's you, lift up that hand. Come on, lift it up. Yeah, hands all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, right here, lift up that other hand. Come on, lift up that other hand. Come on, lift up both those hands right there. Lord, for every person who has those hands in the air, wake up in the name of Jesus. Wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up in the name of Jesus. Wake up, wake up. Wake up in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I call you to wake up in Jesus' name. God, let your fire fall. Let your wind blow. Let your glory come down and fill their hearts again. Lord, breathe. Breathe a fresh wind of your spirit in their life today. Breathe a fresh wind of your spirit in their life today. Come on, lift those hands again. Lift those hands again. Those of you who are asking for it, lift those hands again. God, breathe. Feel them fresh and new. Set their hearts on fire for you. Set their hearts on fire for you. Set their hearts on Ah, that's my prayer, Lord. Set their hearts on fire. 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 Set their hearts on fire, God. 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 Do it, Lord. 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 Do it, God. Do it, God. In the name of Jesus. Hey, church. I need to know. I need to know. Are we going to be a church? that gets in bed with the devil or are we going to stay out and stay awake come on if we're going to be awake alive thriving spirit filled church come on lift those hands all over this house come on lift those hands God here we are in this altar today as a church with hands lifted and hearts lifted We will not get into bed with Jezebel. We will not get into bed with the devil. God, we're going to stay awake. Stay awake. Stay awake. We're going to watch and be ready because we want to be found faithful. Oh, Jesus, set this house on fire. Set this church on fire. Set this church on fire, God. We're here for it, God. Whatever you want to do, God, set this church on fire. Come on, lift your voice, Avenue. Don't just listen to me. Set their hearts on fire, God. Set this church on fire, God. Oh, God, set our hearts on fire for you, Lord. Hang on, hang on, just just because I do, I do got to get you out of here at some point. Verse 4 through 6, I'm done. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and His angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here's what this is showing you. I'm going to tell you 
what your feel-good pastors will never tell you. This tells us that there is a chance of having your name removed from the book of life. Pastor, that's not possible. Yes, it is, honey. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12 says, Watch out, brothers, so that you, so that there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that departs from the living God. I want to pray for you. Anybody here? Anybody here? Anybody online? Anybody here? If there is any doubt in your mind, where you spend eternity let me pray with you right now don't be caught sleeping with the devil if you get caught sleeping with the devil you'll get the devil's punishment you'll get the same thing Jezebel gets all over this house I want to count to three if you don't have a relationship with Jesus or you've gotten in bed with the devil and today you need to recommit your life to Christ. I want, to, I want to count to three. If that's you, I want you to lift that hand all over this house. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If that's you, one, two. I don't care who's around you. It's between you and God right now. You want to pray this with me? Three, lift that hand up. Yeah, yeah. Hey, keep, that, hey, keep that hand up. Keep that hand up. Yeah, I see you. Praise God. Praise God. Just keep that hand up over here on my far right. A couple right here in front of me. Just, just wiggle your way through, prayer team. You're all right. Just, just say, excuse me. Boy, right, keep that hand up. Just keep that hand up. Don't be ashamed right here. Come on now. We're, we're, we're getting things right. A couple over here. Do we get the one over right here? We got somebody online. Talk to our team online. Right here. We got one right here. Got Proud of you, bro. Proud of you. Hey, those of you who lifted, we got, we, we need another one. We good? Those of you who with that hand lifted, I want you to pray this from your heart and from your mouth. Abby, let's join them. I want you to say, Jesus, I need you. I'm lost without you. Thank you for your letter. Today, I get out of bed with the devil. And I'm following after you. Forgive me of my sins. Jesus, you are Lord. And from this day forward, I'm following after you because you're my Savior. And you love me in Jesus' name. And the church shout amen. Come on. Somebody give God a big shout of praise. If this message spoke to you today and you took your next step of making a decision to know Christ, we want to celebrate with you and walk this out with you. Simply click the link in the comments below and a pastor will reach out to you and celebrate the greatest decision you have ever made. At The Avenue, we know that we're stronger together, everyone matters, and you belong here.